so I'm the guest speaker. <laughs> so some of you, I'm just the old fart. <laughs> oh, how many years? I love Jeremy's uh, boy's energy level. It's really cool. And uh, yeah, I probably am out of practice doing this. So even right there, how old am I getting? And I have to stand back from my notes. And actually, I have notes. I actually made notes for you guys today because unlike most today's speakers or pastors, they, they do it all on their pads, you know, so um, I'm a little fashion that way. But hey, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a beautiful day this is that you've given us. Father, the, especially this opportunity for us to come together and just worship you and praise you. And, and Father, just to, to grow in you, Lord, and to be with you. That's what Sunday's all about. And you know what? The blessing here is that we get to be with each other. So being here as, as the family of God uh, and growing together is, is so uh, rich of an opportunity. So thank you for blessing us with this day. And Lord, may we bless you in everything we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good to see you guys. So, you know, social media is a big topic, isn't it? It's just out there. I think it is what we do anymore. How many of you are on some kind of social media? Oh, come on. I know there's more than that. Come on. I know you're out there. Social media is like the way we connect with each other, right? It's how we connect with family. It's friends. It's, it's how we share our ideas and our opinions, right? There's nothing more important than getting on there and going, oh, this is how I feel or whatever. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a social media kind of guru. I like getting on there and reading and, you know, uh, and, and seeing what people are posting. It's big. That's really what we've done as a church one of our greatest ways where we advertise and promote what we're doing here is through Facebook. So if you're not on our Facebook page, please go there. First Christian Church Facebook page, all right? Because that's how we communicate. Social media, well, maybe not to you guys in the room, but it is a huge, huge thing. In fact, I don't know if we know how big it is. Do you know how many people there are in the world today? 7.8 million people, Okay. Billion. Did I say million? Yeah, billion. Thank you. Seven, eight million. That wouldn't be very many. That'd be just in our area. 7.8 billion people. So here's the monthly average viewers of the top five. Here's Facebook. Facebook is number one. Get this. They have an average monthly usage of 2.96 billion people. So almost half of the world is on Facebook. You might not be, but half the world is, okay? The next one is YouTube, 2.2 billion viewers. The third one is WhatsApp. I don't even have that one. They may have WhatsApp. You probably should because that's the third biggest one. That's 2 billion as well. Instagram is fourth. That's also 2 million users. And then the fifth one is WeChat, which I'm not a part of that one. That's 1.26 billion users every month. I can say that social media is a big thing, isn't it? In fact, I'm, I, like I said, I'm kind of a guru. I like, per, personally, I like YouTube. I like using YouTube. Oh, I love going on and watching people put on their, on their little videos, you know, usually from, from, you know, 30 seconds to a couple minutes long and, and watching what they put on. And people are, I mean, it's, it's kind of like having Hollywood all out there. Everybody are, is, is making their own videos and, and doing their own programming. And it's really cool to watch. I could say I've become a fan of YouTube. But one of the things that really interests me about all the social media, and especially YouTube, is the desire for that social media to gain commitment from the viewers. See, the one thing about YouTube, when I first started years ago, I, I would just call myself a watcher. I'd go on and I would watch the videos and I would have my interests and so I'd type it in and, and bring it up. Eventually, I became more of a fan. So now I, I can go on and being a fan, I, I made that next level of commitment and, and now I subscribe. So I have these people that I like to follow, so I subscribe to their channel, which means now I get notifications of when they post a new video. So, you know, in the morning I, I get up and I'm having my cup of coffee and I'm, I'm seeing, you know, who posted something on YouTube. In the evening before I go to bed, who posted something new? What notification did I get? But that doesn't stop there. There actually becomes a third level, which is a major, major commitment to this social media, especially YouTube. YouTube wants us to buy all into it. 
So not only are you a fan and you're, you got, you know, you're subscribing to several different people, but you can actually start doing your own videos, which is kind of fun and unique. And you can start to actually meet and greet because these people that are doing videos, they have like-minded people and they'll start doing meet and greets. Like, hey, I'm going to be in this part of the country. Come meet me. Let's talk. Or you can start just, you know, corresponding with them through text and, and emails. And then they have this thing called Patreon. So if you really like what they're putting out, you can financially help them. That's a pretty big commitment right there. I haven't reached that, that level yet. I'm not, I, I'm not into Patreon. I'm not supporting anyone financially. But guess what? I've actually, you know, created a few videos myself. The church has over 250 YouTube videos. Did you guys know that? Yeah, we've been actually live on YouTube for three and a half years. So there, if you want to go back and watch the message from three years ago, you can do that. Take popcorn with you, take your pillow. You might, you know, it might snooze through it, but hey, it's kind of fun to watch. Now, the thing that, the connection I want to make today, there, there's kind of a stigma with Christianity that's it's similar to, to YouTube. In Christianity, we have people that just like to watch. In Christianity, we have people that might be a fan. They might be saying, you know, I'm willing to, to kind of commit to what's going on. I'll, I'll be at church every so often, you know, see what we call CEOs, Christmas, Easter only. Uh, that was the term we used to use. I don't like using that one anymore. But then it might be, well, I might support this, I might support that. But they're not really all committed. And then there are those that are committed. There are those who are faithfully walking with the Lord. They're reading their Bibles. They're studying. They're, they're in praising God wherever they go. Uh, they're serving and giving. They've moved past that, that fan stage or a watching stage to being fully committed followers of Jesus. Now, you have to ask yourself, what's the difference? What's the difference between being a watcher of faith to a fan where you're kind of just hanging out to being someone that's a fully developed follower of Jesus Christ or developing? Because I don't know if we fully ever get developed, but we're de definitely being developed in Christ. What's the difference? Well, it's a term we don't always use a lot. I don't know if it scares some of us. You know, it's like, ah, I don't know if I want to go there. But the whole idea is spiritual growth. Are we growing spiritually in the Lord? We used to use th that theme a lot, but you don't see it talked about as much. We still desire it. We still pray as pastors that everyone is getting to know the Lord greater every day of their lives and serving and growing in Him. But you don't usually have one of us say, up and go, you need to grow spiritually. Because it sounds like now I'm saying, you know, you have to do this. You don't have to. You have a choice here. What we desire is that you want to grow with the Lord. And so that's why we're hoping you're doing that. Because when we are first newbies, when we first receive Jesus, we're like babies. And Scripture has a lot to say about being a spiritual infant and being a baby. We have to grow. That's how God created in nature. God created us to grow. You think just like a baby. I mean, I have four grandchildren, so I see, this, I see them at different stages right now, and it's really awesome. Right now, we have almost a six-month-old. You know what? So right now, she's just starting to kind of, starting to just barely starting to roll over and crawl, you know, and pretty soon she's going to be sitting up all by herself, you know. Next thing I know, she's going to be asking for a glass of milk and spilling it all over the floor. Next thing you know, she'll probably be asking for the car keys and saying she's got her first date, you know? I, it's, just, it's amazing how kids grow, but that's what happens. Spiritually growing is very similar like that. We start off as infants. We're babies. And Scripture tells us we are being fed spiritual milk. But we age. That's God's plan for us to age and grow in the Christ, led by Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, we grow. And that one day we quit drinking milk and we start eating meat. The meat of God's word, the meat of serving, the meat of, of giving and of growing together. 
And that's all done through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We have to grow. We need to grow. I shouldn't say have, because I guess we can choose not to. But we should grow. We should want to grow. And that's my hope for all of us here today, is that we're growing. The blessing that we have is that, as infants, God meets us where we are. You know what? God is working on us the minute we say, yes, Lord, I need you in my life. I want you to come into my heart. And Jesus says that was my plan from the very beginning. He awakens our spirit. We're now we're, we're in spirit with him. And he meets us in our messy lives. And we're drinking milk. And the Lord's going, now get in my word and grow. He accepts us where we are. And if you're reading Scripture, Scripture is all full of challenges, challenging us to grow. And we're going to see that today. We're going to be looking at James 2. We started this series in James. Um, <laughs> one thing, Jeremy going, I really want to do James 2, but it was just the way it worked out. It just happens to be today's James 2. And James 2 has a big, big challenge for us. It has everything to do with spiritual growth. And that's why I wanted to kind of remind us of some of the things that Scripture says before we even get into James 2. One of the things that God tells us in, in Hebrews 6, 1, says, Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So Scripture is telling us we have to grow. We need to grow. Stop drinking that milk there comes a time where we age we age physically and and spiritually we start feeding on solid foods we need to move from being spiritual babies to spiritual adults again that's a process it doesn't happen overnight sometimes it can be actually slower than our physical aging and sometimes it happens faster but the thing is one thing I've, I think I've learned from the book of James is it's all about spiritual maturity. Here we have Jesus' brother, James, talking about some very, very important things about how to live and how to be a Christ follower and, and what it means to, 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 to live for God. And again, it's something we don't necessarily talk about, that spiritual growth, but we need to. We need to be encouraging one another to grow. And even as Jeremy talked last week when he was looking at James 1, you know, it starts off with some real challenges. Um, it talks about how when we go through trials, we should endure those trials. Don't see them as hardships, but grow in them. That's all about maturing. That's all about growing. Moving from being a baby to going, yeah, these trials, I don't like them, but I can see what God is doing for me or teaching me through these trials. And I will endure these trials. And that's how we mature. Maturity in Christ has nothing to do with our biological age. We can become a believer at 50 and and mature starting from that point. We can become a believer at 12 and mature spiritually from that point. It has everything to do with how we live and the decisions we're making. And most importantly, are we walking with Christ? In Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7, it says there, As we have received Christ, so let us walk with Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as we have been taught, abounding in thanksgiving. We're supposed to walk in Christ. We don't do this alone. God initiates it in us. The Holy Spirit leads us. And we walk in with Christ. That's a great trifecta, isn't it? That's how we should be. Okay. So now I've set up the second chapter of James. Now what's interesting, and I really challenge you to go home today or sometime this week, read chapter 2 of James. And I really want you to spend some time reading through it slowly and considering what I'm going to talk about right now. Because one of the things that, you'll, that I think you'll notice is that it seems like James chapter 2 is broken into two pieces. But it's not. It seems to be two separate kind of thoughts written by James, but it's not. It's actually one 
that's tied together. So that's why we're gonna, how we're going to look at it today. And I hope that as you read through it this week, again, I challenge you to do that. I want you to consider, are you growing spiritually? Do you feel yourself challenged to? Do you feel like you're learning more? Are you serving more? Are you are desiring fellowship? All those things that would say are, are things that bring you closer to Christ. You know, one of the things <laughs> I've realized that I'm getting older. I don't have time to, to kind of wait and think, Lord, you can grow me in a year from now because, you know, maybe I'm not ready. Actually, at the end of this week, I'm going to be uh, entering into a new decade of life. So, yeah, the gray hair is earned. Gray beard is earned. And in that, it, you know, you start to go, you know what? There's only so much time left. And I think that's made me even more excited to know what God wants me to do. And that's my prayer. Is, God, what do you want me to do at this stage in my life? Lord, how can I serve you? How can I serve your people? Now, one of the greatest lessons in my life comes from James 2. And maybe as you read this, I hopefully as you read this, it will be a major life lesson for you. First of all, it reminds me that I am a work in progress. As a Christian, as a Christ follower, I am a work in progress that is not finished. And this side of heaven is never, I'm never going to be finished. I hope I continually grow in Christ. And the other thing is, <laughs> one of the things that's really taught me is that... Uh, as a mature Christian or a maturing Christian, I need to stop pointing out anyone else's faults and only consider my own. Because it's really easy to judge the world and judge others and go, oh, you sinner out there, and not go, you know what, I'm the greatest of sinners. I have a lot of work to be done in myself. There's a lot of ways I can improve in Christ. D.L. Moody who was a great American evangelist and publisher, he said this of himself. I've had more trouble with myself than any other man I've ever met. I would say that's true with me. There's some mornings I get up and go, oh Lord, why me? Why do you bless me? Why do you care about me? I'm the greatest of sinners. Jesus spoke the truth about this. He knew we were going to struggle with this major issue. The Sermon on the Mount, I love the Sermon on the Mount. I love reading it. It's one of the greatest teachings about how to live for Jesus. And in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Jesus says this. He says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. You will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? A log, you know? You hypocrite. Jesus didn't mince words there. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Pretty clear, but sometimes it isn't for folks. Jesus often spoken parables and sometimes it leaves people confused so that's why i like the apostles they have a tendency to to take what jesus said and in this case what james takes what his brother said and he and he continues to teach on it and kind of helps us to understand it so as james 2 opens this is what james says this is an affirmation of what jesus just said james says my brothers show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Show no partiality. What's that mean? Do not judge others. This is what Jesus said. Do not judge others. Judgment can lead to prejudices. And prejudice leads to discrimination. It all falls in a line. In James's case, he gives us an example to understand. Maybe a little bit clearer than what Jesus talked about the log. Maybe people go, what's it mean to have a speck in a log? Well, James says this, starting in verse 2. He says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, 
And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. That's a pretty low place. Sit at my feet. Have you not then made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Let me ask you this. How many times have you ever judged a person and was wrong? Or you judge the situation and you got it all wrong. How'd you feel? Do you feel like, oh, why did I do that? Why am I like that? Why am I so judging? Hey, I'll be the first to admit I do that. What's interesting is, like, if you look at me, like yesterday, I love riding my motorcycle. I'm a Harley guy, you know, so it's loud and it rumbles. And, and when you pull up sites, people are like, like this. And then I've got my leather, my black helmet on, my leathers, you know, and then I've got my, I actually trimmed this for you today. I had this up yesterday and I have it all there and sometimes my face has got grease on it. I mean, I've actually had people come out and they take their kids and go, don't go, that's like, don't go near that guy. He looks kind of scary. And it's like, man, I wish they'd only know me. I just put it on because leather protects you in case you wipe out. A helmet is a good thing. You know, it's not a bad thing. The motorcycle, well, yeah, loud pipes save lives. I live by that theme. You've heard that one, right? Loud pipes save lives. But, you know, I've been there too. I probably have took my kids and go, oh, don't go near that guy. Don't near, go near that homeless guy. He's just going to beg us for money. He's just going to want some food. That's why I say I'm a work in progress. Sometimes I judge people. And I hope I never discriminate, but it's probably followed. So let's continue what James says, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Turns that around, makes see the truth. Are not they the ones who blasphemy and the honorable name by which you were called? <laughs> Jesus and James is teaching the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes we honor those that, you know what, don't deserve it. And we dishonor those ones that just need some love and care and attention. And this is so important to us as the church, people. Because how do we treat others? More important, how do we treat people on Sunday morning? Is everyone welcome? I hope so, because if we're not welcoming, if we're not greeting, if we're not getting to know each other and, and, and new faces we see, then we're probably discriminating. Very unintentionally, but we're discriminating. So we've got to make sure we're not doing that. We don't want to discriminate. We don't want to judge based on color, creed, or, or background, or race, or language, or beliefs. And I love how James puts it, just like Jesus. Jesus called us hypocrites. James says this in verse 8, If you really are faithful, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. It doesn't beat around the bush. You're committing a sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Which means, well, just because maybe I'm, I'm, you know, I do everything else well, if I judge, no, no, you can't do that. You can't level sin against sin or sin against good behavior. If sin is sin, that's all there is to it. Verse 11, For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. James pretty clearly says it's a sin to discriminate. It's a sin to judge. Got to be a work in progress. And James knew this even of himself. And then he gives us the answer. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think somebody else said that too. Was that Jesus that said that? Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 12, James goes on. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. What's the law of liberty? Who's those? That's us. We're walking in God's grace. You know, in God's grace, 
we have been forgiven of our sins. And in that forgiveness, we have the liberty to love like Jesus loves. To not judge people just like Jesus didn't judge people. Just to be like Christ to others. And then in verse 13, it says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy trumps, triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We have to start with, with love and mercy and grace as the foundation. That's how we prevent prejudices and then discrimination from occurring. Only by the grace of God. I can say that. Only by the grace of God. If it was on my own power, I'd still be judging. I'd still judge. Only by the grace of I, God do I go. I start to go, mm, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go there. Let's go learn about this person first. Let's go get their name. Why are they dressed like that? Or why are they behaving like that? And so forth. One thing I learned a long time ago in reading through James is, you know what? I'm not the lawgiver. I'm not the enforcer of the law. I'm not in charge of the outcome. God is. I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to pray and, and be concerned about what Jesus is concerned about. Even James, who was known as probably one of the most devout, deeply mature Christians of the time, he said this, and it included himself. In the next chapter, in chapter 3, verse 2, James says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. We, he didn't exclude himself. We all stumble in many ways. We are a work in progress. And I hate to say this, none of you are perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be. You think any of you are going to be perfect? Good. <laughs> We're not. We're a work in progress. As maturing Christians, and I hope we desire growth, we have to pursue this whole concept of, of not being discriminative and being gracious instead to others. Now, we come to the second half of James 2. And again, many people will take this as a second point, but really the two fit together. Well, we need to remember that James was written as a letter so there wouldn't be chapters in this letter, there wouldn't be verses, and there wouldn't be any breakouts of a, of a topical, or there wouldn't be these highlights of, of a different point being made. So think about this. It's all together. So James is just talking about not being biased, not judging, about, you know what, being blessed by the Holy Spirit, being blessed if we don't judge, and giving us this understanding and then he goes into this next point in verse 14, or this point in 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Faith without works. Which is a big, big topic of discussion amongst Christians. And maybe that's why the first half of James is sometimes overlooked. Because people get right to this going, This is a big topic. Faith and works. We talk about that, right? All the time. We don't want to work our way into heaven. Can we do that? No. Faith has to come. But works needs to follow it. There are two similar thoughts. A maturing Christian begins to understand that faith and works goes together. And that there shouldn't be this discrimination because that's a good example if you're a maturing Christian, you should not discriminate. So, James gives us another example, starting in verse 15. He says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and is lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace and be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also by faith itself, it, if it does not have works, it is dead. I have something to do with discrimination? Sure it does. It has everything to do with discrimination. Imagine if someone comes in and you're, and you're meeting them for the first time. They're passing by your home or something like that. And you know what? They look like they could use some help. And, or maybe they come into the church and, and you're getting to know them. 
and they start telling you about what's going on in their lives, and you're going, oh boy, you need a lot of help. Go sit over there, or better yet, go sit at my feet. I don't know how to help you. Why don't you be blessed and go on your way? Saying something like that is basically saying, like, I don't want to deal with you. I'm judging your situation. Go on. It's basically discrimination. Blessing someone and saying, go! Without doing something for them or about their situation is discrimination. It's not what Jesus wants us to do. To do. You know, and as a way, how can they be encouraged in Christ? How can they continue their growth in Christ when all they're seeing from, from a Christian is, get out of here! I don't want to deal with you. It's not the image we should show. So I love this. James throws down. It's like, here's the challenge. Here it is, guys. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from works and I'll show you my faith by my works. What he's saying is you have to have works. If you're committed, if you're spiritually grown, if you want to, desi- if you want to mature or if you are maturing, you are going to have works. You're going to do those things just like Jesus did. You're going to do those things that's been modeled by the apostles. In your works, they should be humble and gracious and obedient and all those things that bring us closer to Jesus and we're caring for others and we're loving on others. This is the response we have as maturing Christians. If we stand back and just say, oh, I have faith. It's not. You might. I watch. I watch. I watch you guys. I judge. Yeah, that's why I'm not truly a Christian, because I'm judging you guys. Stand back. I'm good. That's not how it's played at all. When we worship and praise God, and when we're involved and, and serving however we can, and we're praying and we're caring, those are all works of action that support our faith in Jesus Christ. I like to call it faith works. Faith works. There's a saying that goes like this. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. Amen? The saving faith is a faith that matures. A faith that matures. Spiritual maturity. We're going to have the band come up. As they come up, we'll start to wrap this up. It's a process. Spiritual maturity is process. So don't, you know, write it down on your, on your, put it on your tablet, you know, or put it in your calendar. Well, let's see, today's July 16th, so oh, I think by September 16th I'll be fully mature. It doesn't happen like that. It's a process. One of the greatest followers of Christ who wrote most of the New Testament, Paul. Here's what Paul said about himself in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. The spiritual giant, the spiritual mentor, said this of himself. He says, I have not already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting that old self, straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says it's a process, and he's not going to be there, just like we're not going to be there on this side of heaven. We must be a work in progress, and we need to let the Holy Spirit work on us. Maturing Christians require this radical reorganization, this radical prioritizing of what's important in our lives. And loving others is important in our lives. That's the works that come from the other things that are important, like the spiritual discipline, which is reading and studying God's Word and, and praying and serving and, and, and just fellowship like we do here today. The lesson here is faith in action. You've got to think about it. So often these words are used or thought of as a noun. 
Faith is a verb here. It's an action. Faith works. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, Peter shows us what faith and action can do and how it changes us. This is how faith and works changes us. It says there, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Supplement your faith with virtue, which is an action, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Now that takes a while. That's why it's a work in progress. We're a work in progress. It takes a while. But see, each one of those grows us. It stretches us. For, the, if, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a process of growing. Being effective and fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. I hope that's what we all desire in our lives. Amen? Amen. Mm-hmm.